Hey, so we're back for uh, episode 303 of the Better Call Saul Insider Podcast. I'm Kelly Dixon. I'm Chris McCaleb. Chris, great to see you again. It's good to see you. All right, so uh, you haven't seen, you just saw this episode. I've been yes. working on this, for, but you just yes, saw it. Yes, I've seen it. Yeah? So I guess we should mention our guest too, huh? Absolutely. So we get, we're here with uh, show creators Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould. Hey. Or Peter Gould and Vince Gilligan. Hello. <laughs> we're here with writer uh, Jenny Hutchison. Hello. And we're here with uh, director uh, John Scheiben. Hello. Scheiben, you're back again. I'm back. Yay. 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 John, what's the last one you did? Last podcast no, I did? No, no, the last directing that you did. Uh, two episode, Better Call Saul 205. Rebecca. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Rebecca, where the, we had... Uh, the Kim, Kim have, phone uh, calls. Yeah, the, the Kim yeah. phone calls. And the post-it, uh, the right. infamous post-it montage. Right, right, Tremendous right. episode. Tremendous Thank episode. You. Another tremendous yeah. episode. Some of my favorite shots, that shot when she gets the news, that super wide shot. It looks like uh, it looks like uh, two, three, five to one. Uh, yes. Uh, what, what do they call mm-hmm. that? Wait, what Aspect ratio. Aspect yeah, that, ratio. That, yeah, that. Uh, uh, with that shot. When in the in the basement, in the, the garage. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because of, cool. of the dark roof and the dark floor. Right. Yeah. It looks like a, like a John Ford or, mm-hmm. or a Sergio Leone. When uh, she gets yeah. the news that Paige and Mesa Vert, she got the Mesa Verde. Yes. Yes. Oh, and she great. does her little happy dance. Right. Which yes. And her good mood is soon crushed right. Right. In, that, in, that, in that way. And stylistically, but I have used that shot as an argument to stay in a wide shot, you know, to argue against a studio or a network who are trying to get like, we cut in closer. Cut in closer. Like, we would never do this. It's like, well, actually... <laughs> I love it. Would, great. Does the argument yeah. land? It has landed. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, I've actually on, won that argument. Yeah. Good. Wow. All right, I've good. been on ah. stuff where they're like, "We want the Breaking Bad look. We want the Breaking Bad look," and you do it, and they're like, "Well, why are why are we in these watch shots for so long? Why, we should be in close ups." It always happens. Mm-hmm. Adam Bernstein <laughs> told that story years ago. He got hired, and anyone who's lucky enough to work with him is just like is very lucky indeed. And he got hired for some pilot. They said to him, "We want this Breaking Bad look," and he said, "Okay." And then he had this great shot. There was some. Uh, uh, folks were sitting in a car talking waiting for the ambulance to come after they'd had a car wreck so he had this beautiful shot looking through the spider webbed windshield the broken windshield and he cut it he had his director's cut and the the powers that be the folks he's making it for be they producers or studio or network executives or whatever said what is with this shot i I, you know well this is a this is a breaking bad shot i think it's kind of cool yeah, but we can't we can't see every square millimeter of the actors' faces. We're, we're <laughs> looking through broken glass. Yeah, well, this is you asked for Breaking Bad. This is how they do it over there. Get rid of this. Stop. Ah, oh, it hurts my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> they still want they still want the close-ups. It's funny because you know um, I was doing a pilot last year and and the producers were like, well, we need to be close. And in the network, uh, I guess at that point too, um, network and studio notes, and we need to be closer. And I was like, you know, if you're close all the time, then your close-ups don't mean anything. Yeah. You know, but... It, it, absolutely true. I think it's interesting, though, because... And I, I think this Adam story is... It's a few years old, and I do feel like with the way television's changing, and especially with cable and streaming, yeah. I think network is trying to keep up a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's still definitely, like, a house look in yeah. network. You know, yeah. you can't make that change quite as quickly as they probably yeah. might. Yeah. But there are some shows that are starting you're right. to, like bend it a little bit yeah. and like starting to push against that so hopefully that's a trend that'll continue yeah. you know because there's so much interesting visual storytelling that you can do even on a you know regular old and that's a very show. good point yeah. and, and I, you made me think i'm glad you said that because i want to stress i think there's a lot of wonderful talented people working in network uh writers directors producers and they want to think outside the box just as much as any writer director and producer working in cable but they bump up against. I don't want to make it sound like it's uh, it's it's the creative folks at the networks. They they want to be out out of the box thinkers too, just like you just said. But they they bump up against a lot of fear on the part of the folks they work for. So it, it's uh, it's harder yeah. to make those changes. But but the, you're right. I'm seeing that too in, in network shows now. A lot yeah. Of, yeah, I think a lot of it too is uh, shorter episode orders because network traditionally yeah. you're doing twenty you know twenty two yeah. to twenty four yeah. episodes, and so you don't have the time maybe yeah. to do to yeah. be quite as you know uh, outside the box. So uh, yeah. now that people are getting shorter orders, that allows a little more True. focus on that stuff. And and so. there's always pockets, too. I mean, even 20 years ago, you and I worked on the X-Files. Yeah. And John, the three yeah. of us, worked on the X-Files. And uh, 20 years ago, they, they were uh, Chris Carter set a great example, and all of us there were thinking outside the box oh, yeah. as much as we could. And, and Fox 
that was a Fox for Fox show, Fox Studios for Fox Broadcasting, and they let us think outside the box. Yeah, and, that was uh, a show that was lit so differently than yeah, most shows. It was yeah. a really dark show, and, and yes. I remember that being such a big deal of like you couldn't always see the actors you couldn't always yeah, see what was yeah. going on and they let us I remember the yeah. murder yeah. yeah exactly I, I love God that bless them for it. Yeah. you know the DP would smoke every scene yeah. every single scene <laughs> oh had smoke yeah. yeah it just yeah. didn't matter yeah. yeah it's got smoke anyway there are pockets and of course some of the greatest TV shows of all time are network shows yeah especially before network was all that existed I mean some of my favorite shows of all time Twilight Zone was but a it, it network is, show it is That's funny so though when you look back at some of your favorite shows of your youth and you say it looks like they lit it with Klieg lights and they just yeah. everything is yeah. so yeah. boom you know that's true although Twilight Zone still the photography on that show holds yes. up they yes. have beautiful uh, beautiful photography I, on I that show I think they had an advantage of being a, uh, an anthology show yeah because I, I think that a lot of the time you, tell, you guys tell me you've all worked in more, more shows than I have it seems like a lot of time the concern is, oh, it doesn't look like our show. Yeah, yeah. And let's uh, let's let's make let's make it look like our show. And I, one of the things I'm really proud of on, on this show, on Better Call Saul, is that uh, we tell the directors, you know, you need to tell the story. That's what's important. It doesn't. It's not. We don't have. We have some things that we generally do, but it's you can break. All the rules are breakable. And and one of the things. It's one of the things I'm so proud of. And uh, it's, it, and John John is certainly John certainly brought his own. I to this this episode and to, to all the episodes that he's directed. Absolutely. Well, and I, I'm thank I'm thankful for the script I got to be honest because when you look at it, when you think about it, and the flashy stuff, is not was wasn't really the 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 greatest thing about it to me. It was, I mean, there are whole sections of this that <coughs> is just visual storytelling. Mike's whole storyline, you you don't need any of the dialogue to tell yeah, that story. That's true. So it's a great challenge for a director. How do you do this without somebody walking in a room and saying? Can I buy a bag of meth, please? Okay, yeah. I'm gonna put it in a shoe. It's like, what, what, is, what is he doing? Why, and, and, and so it, it, it's playing that. You Could know. have saved a lot of money. Though. Yeah, yeah. I feel way. like we should have come out with new pages now that you said <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> no, I would it, like to put it, it in a shoe, please. It's such a special I'll take experience. That in a shoe to go. Yeah, exactly. No, as a director, it's 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 great because you you're forced yeah. to say, okay, how are we gonna tell this story, and how visually can we make it? You know, compelling and mysterious and interesting and not confusing. And, and uh, so thank you for that, Jen. How did you guys me. come up with Thanks. that? How did, how, what was the genesis of that? Of the mic, the mic mm. shoe thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was, so we knew we wanted Mike to do another sort of heisty thing mm. with Hector's trucks. But we knew we didn't want him to do an actual heist, what he had done, because the whole point of that is that someone got hurt and he would not do that again. So we were trying to think of a low impact thing that he could do that would still completely screw Hector, but Mike would be almost invisible. Like it, it would almost be able to, that nothing had actually happened. You know, that it was somebody had made a mistake at the plant or something like that. So we talked a lot about what you could actually do. And I think the idea of like sprinkling meth on the truck came up pretty early. And then it was just figuring out how Mike would actually do that. For a long time, we were talking about doing it at the border crossing in like the lineup. And, you know, maybe Mike has one of the guys who's selling food do it. But again, that's involving another person. And there was just no way that Mike wasn't going to stand out if he was, you know, trying to sell food. Um, it's kind of weird. You know, he, he definitely Would you doesn't like a churro? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then we thought maybe he has a BB gun. <laughs> You know, with like a, a capsule that would disintegrate, and then we were we just had all these kind of crazy ideas, and then um, I think maybe Peter talked about maybe he's dry, there's a, an area in a town that has streamers or something hanging over the road, and he manages to hang something, and then the idea of the shoes came up because I think I, almost everybody has seen shoes hanging from power lines, mm -hmm. and you know there's all sorts of urban legends about them. Nobody really knows where they come from, but everybody sees them, and so we kind of uh, landed on that. And then it was figuring out what's a good location for this because you don't really want anybody around. It's a really quick shot that has to be made. And so we just started like whittling it down and whittling it down from there. And so then ultimately we came up with this T-junction. And then our locations department magically found one that fit exactly what we needed. I mean, we technically added the power lines, but um, otherwise the setup, because we needed a T-junction 
uh, with some sort of bluff overlooking it where Mike could be set up. I mean, it was kind of an impossible task, and they found it really quickly. Christian and his folks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and very close to the studio, which Super is close. perfect. Was it really? I was going to ask because yeah. I never knew where you, this was. When you pass uh, on your way you know, from the freeway and yeah. you're going, and then you go down that big hill, yeah. uh, and there's a bridge at the bottom. Yeah. If you get off there and and drive, it's right there. You're kidding! Right it was there. that close? You could walk there from the studio. I mean, it'd be you, a long walk. You could, uh, yeah, as the, yeah, you could if you could go you straight, but it's fenced off because there's a uh, ah, okay. there's like a, a drag strip up on top. Yeah. Of oh yeah, the, oh, the drag strip part. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I've it's, been it's, been but as the crow flies, you could see the water tower or whatever that thing wow, is. Ah yeah. Yeah, we yeah. had to make sure it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Shot, so. I, I remember when you guys, because uh, Jenny, I think, were here in LA, and you guys in Albuquerque were presenting the locations. And I saw that, and the first thing I thought was, oh, boy, I bet they're going to have Because I was thinking of some of the other locations we've gone to where it was like a two-hour drive. I was like, oh, how, how far away is this? And, and Robin was kind of sly. She said, it's, it's accessible. Uh, <laughs> so it was, it was great. <laughs> it's it's wonderful that it was that close. And also, Jenny brought something up that I at least think is worth mentioning, <clears throat> is that you guys only had how many, t- how many actual power lines did you have? How po- power two, poles two did you poles, have? Two poles, one wire. Well, then how is it when I watch the the episode, I see those poles going off to infinity? You know, that's the magic of cinema. Okay, yes. It's, it's, yeah. It is. You're like Huel Hauser. I am yeah. like Huel Hauser in so many I ways. Love, I love podcasts here. Here we are. Yeah. Albuquerque <laughs> <you go. laughs> What is this? I, sure, I would like to be buff like Huel Hauser. Um, I miss Huel Hauser. Yeah, me too. Huel Hauser was He was awesome. great. Anyone he who doesn't live in California doesn't know Google Huel Hauser. He was a... I would love to have met him. He, yeah. I, I still love his show. He's wonderful. Yeah. He's wonderful. Of course, that was uh, the, the, the digital component of that, which I think is invisible. I think it's just a great yeah. series of special effect shots. Uh, was, it was all extended by Bill Pulowski and his, 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 his good folks. I would never have suspected that. Absolutely. No, no, yeah, neither. sometimes the best visual effects in a show or a movie are the ones that you just you have no idea that somebody's actually doing visual effects, it's you true. know? Like it's exactly. not just like the monsters in the spaceships, it's <laughs> wire removal yeah. or addition and extending backgrounds yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. I think by the way that's a good thing they've done in the business now. They have two different awards to Emmys and probably at the Oscars too. I don't know as much about the Oscars where they give the visual effects award for the the stuff you do notice, the spaceships and the aliens, and then they give the award for the stuff you don't notice. Oh, do they? I think oh, that's it's, so it's, it's, it's the craziest category. It's, an, it's the Emmys. It's, it's the Emmys. It's visual yeah, effects Oscars, I think in is a supporting only role. It is supporting role. For, for real. For real. Oh, okay. And, and Bill Pulaski was up for one yeah. last year for us for the um, for the sequence at the airfield uh, the, at the border. The border. Yeah, crossing. 208, yes. And deservedly so. It's and, really and, uh, amazing uh, stuff. Beefy. He had some wonderful competition, but... I'm biased than I am. I wish he had won, but uh, mm-hmm. it was. It was uh, he's 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 marvelous. He's uh, does an excellent job. So that that teaser, I don't know why, but it didn't occur to me that it actually takes place in Breaking Bad time. Yeah, it's it's an unspecified long period of time um, yeah, after the shoes. Better because the shoes are very very weathered, and obviously shoes will weather faster mm-hmm. in a desert environment. But um, it's at least several years down the line, and and that's a, a common route now. And the shoes were designed, I hear, by Jennifer Bryan. Yeah, talk yeah. about that. Talk about that. Yeah, we, because uh, in our, when we were talking about it, we were, oh, you know, like Red Converse or something like that. And then uh, Jennifer Bryan, who's our wonderful costume designer, and, and it's one of the things I really love about about her is she's, she's a storyteller. So, you know, when she approaches, um, costuming like she approaches it from a story point of view and uh, so much of the work she does you guys probably don't even notice um but it's it's really amazing and so I think she was like well let's make some shoes and had this idea to design these and we had many different options and kind of landed on what we what we ended up with and she found a really company cool. to, to to put out a small batch of them a yeah. company in China who uh, did a wonderful job who she told me the story they had a flood in the in the area where the factory was and they they had to come in in rowboats to finish the because it was it was a wow. natural disaster Jeez. in this valley yeah. or wherever it was in China and these guys came in in rowboats to get to the factory to finish this production run of, of like 12 shoes or whatever 12 pairs of shoes or wow. Yeah. wow I hope they were okay wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> can you bless. guys do you guys know how they aged them do you know uh, I don't know specific I mean I know they have techniques but I'm not sure huh. of how they exactly because exactly. they definitely they look like they look great they did a really good job bleach. especially because they're multiple materials you know yeah. there's leather and canvas in there and I would guess 
and we should get her in on this. Uh, we guess a lot of bleach and a lot of uh, tumbling in a dryer with and lots of torn up lots too, of rocks you know? and yeah. whatnot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and I think like I think that them. they actually will like use like you know abrasives against them Sand, and stuff uh, like Bell that. Yeah. And what, yeah, yeah, I bet you're right. Huh. Yeah. But yeah, they they look good. And then we had to break the shoelaces, which was also special effects was involved in that. Doing that was, the, the break. That was very complicated. <laughs> there were there were a lot of wire removal because there were wires coming off of the laces. There were wires coming off of the bottom of the shoe where the bullet is supposed to go through, wow. so that it, that could be moved. And there were little squibs in there so that we could set off a little explosion that would pop the. Actually, the the the, the lace was interesting because it was it was almost it was like a, a, a the magnet was on I think. And then when they would kill the power, it would do this or oh, some. Wow. They had some complicated like thing they came up with. Or yeah, it was really. Oh, to have them fall. So that, because it was wow. already Magnets, pre-cut. Bitch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then a boom. Yeah, it was originally science. we were gonna like burn. There was like a burning thing, but there was this. But you could see the spark you could or see something. The spark, yeah. and it wasn't the timing yeah, was harder. Was so then they came up really with this other idea. Really complicated How did you guys get? We, we, to, I also want to mention though. Sorry yeah, to interrupt. No, sorry. I want to mention that I, it kept on my. My head started exploding when we started doing tests. Like, what it would, I, because you start looking at the tests and you start pulling them apart mentally. And so, finally, uh, I asked for them to actually just really shoot a shoe. Yeah. Uh, which, 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 uh, which our special effects department did. They took. They With took a real rifle. They Happily. took a, they they, took they a were rifle. So excited. They were very happy. They took a real rifle and shot a real, a real, sh- not not one of Jennifer's shoes. Right. It was just it was a, a, another like another a shoe. Taylor so we could see. So we could see what it looked what it looked like. And I have to say, I think uh, the final version is pretty damn realistic. Yeah, the, absolutely. It's a super complicated thing because there's three elements with those shoes because you have to you have to blow the hole for the two holes for the bullet. You have to drop the powder, so you have to have the right consistency, and uh, you know you have mm-hmm. to have enough. And then you have to pop the laces so it falls. So it's like a really wow. it's shoes falling off a line mm-hmm. or shoes getting shot, and like but there's all these elements that go into. it. Yeah, because I'm going to ask a really dumb question, and, you know, I don't mean it to be stupid, but when you guys are coming up with it, because you guys have come up with a lot of different gags in both shows, in Breaking Bad, and, and, and do you ever, like, when you guys are thinking about the actual thing, um, the actual plot point or the actual, you know, thing you're going to use, does it ever occur to you, like, they can't really do this. Do you it's ever not think about the logistics? I know it's not your I know yes. it's not your department, but do you ever think about the logistics of we, actually getting it I done? I think that's all we think about. I, we think about it a lot. It's it's interesting cuz I do think there's this there is a little bit of this perception that maybe writers that they're going, "Oh, let's do this and let's do that." And uh, when you're originally breaking a story, you do tend to try to do that because you don't want to uh, put like sort of false limits on yourself when you're trying to come up with a story. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you have a general kind of idea or like an area, then you start thinking, okay, what's the coolest thing we can do that's also producible? Um, And how much can we push that if it's something, like in Breaking Bad, you know, we want to do this train heist. And so that we knew going in and we we warned production well in advance. And we were like, how can we best make this? But for something like this, it is, you definitely do think of those things. Sometimes things come up where they end up being more complicated than you expected. We try to inc- uh, we try to include production as early as possible in most of those conversations if we know something's going to be big. And I think we ta- we probably <laughs> did alert production a little bit early on. Hey, we're going to do this thing with the shoe, um, and there's going to be some special effects and some visual effects involved. So we should get on that. Um, but it is something that you think about. Sometimes you make compromises because. You know, the st- you really want to sell that story point, but it, I, I think most responsible producers, <laughs> uh, writer producers, are trying to think of that stuff. Because the worst thing is to get on set um, or get into prep, and you can't do something, and then you have to very quickly rewrite your story. You don't yeah. want to do that. No. So. I think the other thing that, that I think about too is: is this a challenge? That's if we overcome it, it's going to be interesting and unusual. We're going to see something that we haven't seen before. Because there is stuff that. We'll just go, if, you know, you can have a scene with people driving in a car. And if you're on a trailer and, you know, if, if it's a long scene, that can be a huge pain in the ass. That yes. can actually yeah. be Almost as com- impossible. That can be as, as complicated as anything that we yeah. talk about with shooting a pair of, a pair of shoes with all these different cues. But in the end, the audience, just, that's another sh- scene of people driving in a car. They've seen it a million times yeah. before. So, you know, you can have, you know, glass, <laughs> glass flying. And uh, it can be it can be a huge pain in the ass to do, but 
it may not it may not make much of an impression because people have seen it before. So I think that's the other thing that we try to do is to pick our challenges and make them things that are worth doing. And that's, that's one of the things I think the crew the crew loves actually. I don't want to make it sound like they, they hate they hate doing something that's different. They tell you at least. <laughs> they they like I think They're they like up for a challenge. I think yeah. they like doing I think the truth is that these are all creative folks who would rather be trying something different than just going back into the book and pulling out the gag that they did 50 times before. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm saying. No, 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 and they it, I spent a couple hours in the back of a truck with some really talented crew members pouring different uh, uh, items through a funnel to make it look like the meth wow. for that shot. We did the pickup shot. Yes. Wow. And it was like, I've got Splenda. And he's pouring wow. Splenda. I've got salt. <laughs> and he had like brought like 10 different things wow. and we're trying them in different, in different consistencies you plot, and different levels. Did you try meth? And I asked for it. <laughs> I it wasn't them. in the budget. Want, they did have. <laughs> I want verite. When we were out at the uh, when we were at the border crossing, the uh, the the dog handler, who it was a real drug sniffing dog, and wow. they said, "Well, we've got uh, some heroin." And I said, "What?" And like Robin was like, "What? You can't bring that here." She goes, "No, no, no. It's the essence of heroin. It was it was it was the smell that heroin, the pheromone that heroin oh, gives off, like a cologne." The dog it was like heroin. 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 I know. It's like essence of heroin. Essence, yes, essence heroin. of heroin. <laughs> and they had it in a little. Or uh, when you want to box, extract they, a junkie. Put, they hit it underneath the truck, and the dog would go right to but it. But we learned that on Breaking Bad, though, when they brought the dogs into the laundry, that the dog, you I think you told us about this, where the dog, they want the dog to succeed or something, so they want yes. it to find it. It wasn't it. that. The, the, every now and then they got to bring the real stuff, not just to test that the dog has that good a nose, but literally to give the dog positive reinforcement. That's what I meant. Yes. Yeah, because yes. if the dog goes too long without finding something, the dog gets discouraged. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it was fascinating to watch those dogs because they so wanted to please yeah. their masters. They so it's like, please let me find something. Please let me find something. Please, please, please. That dog, really that dog awesome. is wonder. I mean, we're jumping all over the place. That what was wonder, the dog's that, name? I'm sorry. The Go dog ahead. is wonderful. He's such the way you shot it and uh, uh, and the way the way it's cut. It's just it's just it's the it's dog great. is heroic. <laughs> He's he wonderful. Is. He is. Yeah, he what, doesn't what was talk. He doesn't bark. He doesn't talk. He doesn't bark, and he just sits. It's good. It's yeah. really yeah. good. Yeah. And, I, and I like too that to use the real thing. Most folks would be like, most directors would be like, and and, and producers and writers would be like. Oh, the dog's got to bark like crazy when it finds a dope. And in real life, they absolutely, that's a big no-no. They don't train them to do that because, think about it, what happens when a dog starts barking when it finds a dope, the guy who's the bad guy goes running for his life. <laughs> yes, so exactly. So this is, they, right? They keep it quiet. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah, and that was that was a, that was a challenge we gave you. <laughs> it was, and that, actually the dog on screen was our th third dog that oh. we went through. Um, so it, 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 it's one of those things where, you know, you, you know the story you're trying to tell, that you have to work with what you have. And we had a cadaver dog, and that Ooh. worked okay. Did you have a cadaver? And, you know, essence of cadaver. Yeah, essence, essence of cadaver, cadaver. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it be freaky if you got a hit while you were there? <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Wow. So we start off the first act with that great shot of the, of the phone on top of the gas cap. That's where we last met. Yes. That's where we last left Mike. But... Um, I don't know. I could be really wrong, but I don't know if I've seen that really wide shot with that road in the middle. Have we seen that on both shows yet? The That's shot like with the first the, time. The, the S shape, the backward no, S shape. No, 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 no. Just the wide mm -hmm. shot with that you know went out and every. You know, it looks it like it looks like close encounters. Middle. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's that a was beautiful great. shot. Oh, yeah. that thank was you. Really, really no, awesome. I mean, the landscape obviously is insane, and the scene it just called for it to me because these two guys meeting. Gus and, and Mike and it just was it, it, it's like let's just go for as much you know widescreen as we can with that you know and uh, and also it was interesting because this is one of the you know challenges you have in in episodic television is that this this was a, a, a carryover from the end of the last episode so uh, I had to go before Vince shot it I went out and we mm. talked about what he was gonna do and and you know, which sounded really cool and was a lot of stuff I had been thinking of. So I was like, okay, I gotta come with something else now. <laughs> and it's always good to go first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's 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 actually the fun of the challenge. And so um, we came up, with, you know, the, with the first shot of the tracks along the yellow line, and find the phone, mm -hmm. which was different, a different reveal, and and bringing Mike in, uh, uh, and then it was just so fun. And Marshall, uh, our DP, and our camera operators are just so great that it was just like, let's shoot this until they tell us to go home. 
So, Jenny, when in during this conversation that the two of those guys have, they talk about, you know, the Good Samaritan, right? Yeah. And since that was a holdover from last year, and it was really a person we never saw, a person who never had a name, it was just a concept. Was it important, like, you know, when you guys were breaking this episode, to keep that, just to keep reminding the audience about this sort of guilt that Mike was carrying? I mean, I think it's a, it was important to remember that that's, that's definitely a motivation for Mike. When we were approaching the scene, the, the talk about the Good Samaritan was less about reminding the audience about it. It was more illustrating Gus's uh, intuition and his ability to sort of figure out how people work. And so he would have known sort of the circumstances of, of what happened. And once he realized that Mike was the guy who had done it and, and why Mike was you know, sort of going after Hector in the way that he was, we liked the idea that Gus would sort of come to the conclusion that this Good Samaritan thing really, really bothered Mike. So in that scene, it was more about telling us about Gus with the added bonus of reminding people that Mike had inadvertently caused this person's death. So it kind of ended up being a, bit, a twofer. <laughs> it's, it, it's, I, lo- I love what you said. I love the way you wrote it. Because these two guys, so far, the first two episodes have all been about Mike trying to figure out who Gus is. Who's the guy who got the drop on me? And he finds out it's Gus Fring. And that's a Gus Fring, as we know, is a, is a great puzzle. But from Gus's point of view, Mike is also a puzzle. Mike is a very unusual cat, especially in this, in this underworld, because he's not really motivated by greed. Mike has a very unusual set of motivations for anybody, especially for a criminal. And the fact that Gus, it really rings for me the way you wrote it, that Gus has kind of teases out why Mike's doing what he's doing. It means that maybe, maybe Mike might be vulnerable to some kind of manipulation because, of course, the question we have to ask as soon as we see these guys together is, how on earth did Mike end up being uh, Gus's right-hand man? Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and that's, that's why it's, it's such a beautifully directed scene and beautifully written, acted, too. And, and, and I got to say, this was the first time we saw Giancarlo in his full uh, criminal guise. You know, in, in, yes. in, 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 in Vince's episode, we had that one glimpse in that, in that shot when, you, when, when, he's, when, he, when he realizes what's going on with, uh, with Jimmy. But this is the first time we've seen him out of his Poyos costume, and it's something we've been waiting for yeah, for, yeah. for quite a while, That's and it's, it's very rewarding. And it was great seeing, uh, we mentioned in the last podcast, it was great seeing Jeremiah Batsui, mm-hmm. and that's great in this one. Victor. One's, uh, Victor, and great in this one seeing uh, Ray Campbell. That's right. Tyrus Kitt. Oh, uh, yeah. Tyrus! Yes, yes. I he, forgot. I didn't cut this part, so he's I a, He's a good guy. Tyrus. He's a good guy. Was he happy to be back? I didn't I didn't, I didn't Very catch happy, him. very happy. He's a good guy. Yeah. No, it was really fun. How is it that Giancarlo has not aged pretty much? I mean, None pretty much. Guys, and so. we're working backwards. It's crazy, and 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 to see him just slip. So, I, was there any adjustment process for him as far as finding that character and just slipping back into it, or did it just happen for him? How was, well, what was your it was interesting because he he got off the van <laughs> and and he and, and we said hello and it was great and everybody hugging and then he, he pulled me aside and he said uh, uh, he said he was really ex- thrilled to be back and he said it's going to take me a little time to get back into Gus's head. And it was really one take. <laughs> he really did one take. The first take was like, uh, you know, and dropped a line here, and uh, you know, let's do that again, okay. And then he he, he found it very quickly, um, you know, and it was I it was fun was to watch. That was my experience too in the in the episode right before it. The, it. I had much less. He was much in had much smaller a scene, a, a much smaller scene, but he just boom was right into he it. Just got yeah. it. I wonder how quickly it would take him to get back into bugging out's head from do the right thing. <laughs> that would probably take a little Let's find more. out. Just out. Just out. No. So then we've got these two this sort of little double montage kind of thing going on with Jimmy gets arrested and you've got this uh this new music cue playing that you guys found with Thomas. I I didn't do this part so you guys can talk about that. What an epic moment for Jimmy to get Jimmy get arrested. And I think it was relatively late that we realized there was an opportunity for like a little mini montage. I don't remember I I I think mm. that might have actually that might have been something that that came up 
uh, a little bit later. It, and it's, it's just wonderful. I, I'm so fascinated by all the details that you guys captured of, of, uh, of the booking process and of, of a just, great scene. and of the, mo mo and Jimmy is, is a little bit withdrawn and, and Thomas found that wonderful piece of music, which is actually little, little Richard. Oh, is that, uh, is it? It's, that it's Little Richard, know. and it's, it is, it's just terrific. And it's what's fun about it for me, is the way the music works the picture, is that Jimmy's kind of withdrawn. Jimmy's, Jimmy's keeping a stone face, and that music helps you understand what's going on on the inside. Sort of it's, the inner it's, turmoil. It's, it's, it's wonderful, yeah, absolutely. And uh, was that, where did you shoot that? Was that, uh, was that all a, a set? No. It, in, it, the it, studio? It was not, and it was not close to the studio. That one was a ways away. That was an hour and a half, hour, hour and a half away. Was it really? It was near, wow. it's near the airport where the border crossing. Double Eagle. Uh, yeah. It's near the Double Eagle really? Airport. It's an actual detention center which really helped Oh, it's a the lot. real MDC. It's, it, it was. It, oh, now, wow, right. now, ironically, even though there's still uh, cells and, and cots and bars and handcuffs around and things, it is now a, a Girl Scout troop uh, retreat. Wow. What? No oh, way! way. Yeah, yeah, I've always like, said Girl Scouts should be locked up. <laughs> when, there's like cute pictures and like when, artwork that they put we, up. When we first <laughs> wow, scouted, really? when we yeah. first scouted, uh, uh, the walls, you know, that hallway, the, the opening, or one of the opening, the early shot of, of Jimmy being uh, uh, walked walk. in, perp walked in. It's that long hallway. That, yeah, that yeah, yeah, that great shot, yeah. Both sides of that hallway were covered with rainbows and unicorns. And, <laughs> and they said, they said you can't touch the paintings. We're like, what? Oh you can't really? touch the paintings. But um, uh, our uh, amazing art department. Um, Led by Michael Novani. Thank you. Uh, Michael said, don't worry about it. I'm like, what he said don't worry about it and they 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 have this i forget what he called it but it's basically like giant post-it paper okay and it's meant to cover walls and oh. they just cover it with this stuff and it just sticks up there and oh. then they pull it down and it doesn't damage anything it was wow. like wow, oh. perfect. <laughs> and they can paint on it so they like yeah it's like contact paper that's but it doesn't damage the back what it, what that's it's amazing laid on i know it's really fun <laughs> I was so glad to see you using Officer Simon in that uh, scene too. He's the he's the police officer. Was there a perp walking? That great yes. shot you got down the hall, starting on his feet, tilting up, pulling back with him. Uh, officer Simon is the guy, uh, camera uh, right. He was our uh, tech advisor on the first two episodes, and uh, and then and then you put him in the show. So uh, that, he's a good guy. He's, he yeah, is. Like he him. is. No, and he was so helpful with just figuring out. You know, and the the cop who does the. Um, I forget the the the, the man's the gentleman's French, name. Francesco Cordova. Uh, yes, he he's an actual cop as well, yeah. and it just made our lives easier to have people who really know how to handcuff oh, and, yeah. and strip search and Absolutely. all that pleasant yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's a great MDC Metropolitan Detention Center. That's what that stands for. I think I believe I think so. so. But uh, yeah. our research, they ended up with with Bernardino County B C D C on the back, and gotcha. so. Yeah, we ended up having to loop something, didn't we? At some point. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, <laughs> I think we used it interchangeably. At a certain <laughs> okay, point. Good, good. Gotcha. So, yeah. well, so, and you brought back the oh, DA, the uh, ADA, uh, or yeah. whatever. Oh, yeah. Talk, talk about him. Yeah. Talk about him. Peter DeSeth, who plays DDA Oakley. He, you know, because we we saw him last season and in season one, right? We've seen yes. him both seasons. Yeah. Yes. Season one. And this is my first time writing for him. Um, and you know, when you're writing a scene and you kind of have an idea of a character in your head, and obviously I had seen his scenes, and so you write it kind of a particular way, and then an actor comes in and they actually turn them into a person. It's always really interesting. Like I, what Peter did with those scenes was really amazing to me because I wrote it a little more, a little sleazy or a little sad sackier than he ultimately played it. But that stuff is in there. But he also he just sort of like sparkles like he comes off as like a real person yeah, in those scenes he does. And just kind of amazing like i was he's like a, such a treasure on screen he's wonderful you got a great you guys wrote a great and got a great performance out of him and he's so good and what's amazing to me watching it what i what it stuck in my head was he starts off being kind of a sleaze bag and you're thinking or coming kind of coming across that way and you're thinking He's kind of sadistic here. He's kind of taking pleasure. But then he makes this turn toward the end of that first scene, and you see the 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 frat boy, the fratish kind of exterior falls away, and it says, "You're gonna be okay." I mean, you you know, you want me to? Can I do anything for you? Whatever. It was really full bodied. It was it was very nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, he, he's like this Albuquerque gem. He's a local actor. Mm -hmm. I got the privilege of directing him 
in 205 in the bathroom scene. Yeah. Great. Which was a I love that. Great scene. And he That's sucked. where he asked about the car the first time. Right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like, what does he say? Oh, he give you a car? I bet you give you a car. My favorite is but it's Omar. Sweet. <laughs> yes, and you got that I'd back kill in. My you got for yeah. a fireplace or something. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, yes. window Whatever. for what killed my mother. A window. Yeah, yeah window. Uh, no, he's a, he's he's a great comic actor, or he's a great actor in the way. And it's particularly he's he's in, his technique is incredible, and in his prop acting, and that's one of the things that's really frustrating yeah. when you know uh, le- lesser actors, I should say. Where you're, you know, the the how you eat a French fry. He does exactly the same way. How he opens the bags of chips, exactly the same way. Every take, wow. he makes a choice and he sticks with it, and it makes it so much easier to yeah. get great stuff because you're not worried about that. It's yeah. like, where was the bag? Oh, the bag was over here in that take. Well, I can't use this take now. Because yeah. it's, it's, but he, he and you know the scene at the bench. Um, that that is my maybe my favorite scene in the whole episode. That's hard to pin so. down, but that that's a wonderful scene. Talk yeah. about that one. It, yeah. it, it, you know, Bob uh, and I sort of had the same idea at the same time. We kind of came to each other just when we were about to rehearse, and he said we should just do this like uh, the whole thing as a oneer. Now we never thought we would cut the whole scene, but for them to play it that way, mm-hmm. as if it was a play, as if it was a bit of improv yeah. almost. Um, was the key to that because it just got their timing down and they and they're both so good yeah. so we just set the cameras up and uh and kept doing it until they got it down and it was it was such a delight um and and again he you know he's there with his chip bags and he's there with the, and, and then bob comes in with the french fries and the handle there was a lot going on in there but they just they, they they just played so well together and we just we just kept uh you know we let it play it's such it's, a good scene he, he, i'm sorry go ahead it's it's wonderful and it's all to say that uh, you're the comic relief in a show that stars bob, bob Oden. Oden. <laughs> it's kind, yeah, yeah, it's kind yeah, yeah. of amazing yes. i peter also does uh, the way in the way you shot it and the way you cut it uh he holds the screen by himself yeah. for a really long beat at the beginning of the act uh, and I, I think he's, you know, it's just, it, to me, it shows a kind of star quality that you can't take. The guy is opening bags of chips and eating a chip, and you cannot take your eyes off him. And I love he, the way he puts the two bags together. Yeah. Yes. It makes a whole yes. little universe. And then he wiggles his fingers. Yes. Yeah. And then he chooses the largest possible chip yeah, and, yeah, like, yeah. and lands it. I just, I, I feel like both the, the two of them in that scene are so great, and the way they hit so many of those lines. You know, I knew, I, I felt like it was going to be a funny scene because I knew that they were both funny. But then they just kind of gave these reads that seem like the most obvious, perfect read when you see the scene, but that I hadn't necessarily expected. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. they just felt really real and, and and just lines that are almost like, I don't know, they're just sort of throwaway funny stuff, but like made it really, like the got a jam. Like the way yeah. he did got a yes. jam. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, jam. that's right. Or like trans, <laughs> trans fats are the best trans fats. Fats. I was like, that trans was such fats a throwaway the best line fans. for me. And it's I was true. like, this is never going to work. And then he just made it work. And, and I was, Or oh. burgers getting cold. Yeah. And it's just, no, like, it's, it's, it's and his last line, that blows. Like, I just, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just, really and and Bob's yeah. turn is so great too when he realizes that he's not going to get Oakley and you just see the disappointment and then like oh, I gotta continue to play this game so like Bob's doing all this yeah. interesting stuff as well oh, oh no they're, really, both, well, they're both they're both at the top they're of like, the game there are turns yeah. in that scene that yeah. normally would just be sort of a funny scene they're it, wonderful yeah. both it's, of wonderful yeah. it's fun because uh, and it's you know the first episode we saw Peter in was uh, episode two yeah uh, season which one. was yeah. season one and and uh, he's all his only line is petty with a prior yeah and and, and Bob, yet he says it a hundred different ways times. he says it 20 times i remember hearing from bob oh this guy's good <laughs> this guy's this guy's and you know it's it's bob will give us feedback on on guest cast sometimes and this was one time where he was he had a lot of enthusiasm so that season we wrote uh, we had another scene with him in, in, in that in that bathroom, and then boy, we found out. Then John's scene in season uh, in season oh, yeah. two, and now oh, yeah. he's he's just wonderful. I, I have to say, I am, and and uh, Peter is great, and I am just so proud. You have a, a powerhouse supporting cast in, in this slip. episode. Yes. It's it. Yeah. Can I say one thing about uh, just just a quick aside as a because I, I under, my understanding is some folks listen to this for like insight into you know if folks who are trying to get these careers mm-hmm. that we're lucky enough to do. Something you said stuck with me a minute ago about the matching as an actor, and it, it's, I'm glad John said that because it's and I'm not an actor. I don't think any of us sitting here are actors. But from a producer's point of view and a director's point of view, sometimes you you know you see actors, especially some of the younger folks, are like I, I can't be thinking about matching. 
That's uh, that's right. so mechanical. That's so uh, that that's stifling my creativity. Uh, you know, that's for someone else to figure out, some editor or whoever to figure out. Uh, you know, if uh, my hands, my left hand gets a chip in this one, my right hand in this take, who cares? Who cares? That's a stupid thing to worry about. You're boning yourself as an actor, and John just kind of made a good point there. You, if you do your homework as an actor and you nail down the way you're going to do all this business, you still had, you're still creating all that business in the first place, just like Peter did in this scene. Mm -hmm. And if you get it right, take after take, you, it further ensures. And Kelly could speak about this as the so editor, Chris. And, and so mm -hmm. can Chris. I'm sorry, both of you guys. It further ensures that your best stuff is actually going to make it in because I can't tell you we've had over the years, all of us on different shows and and even this show have had moments where the very best stuff and it yeah. killed us yeah to yeah. talk yeah. about that well, yeah i, I want to name drop just a sec quick sorry Ooh. kelly but just i got i was really lucky i got to direct uh, uh bo bridges and lloyd bridges uh <laughs> together and one of the things that struck me about lloyd was and he was in his 80s he would work out his action like picking up a fork he would you'd see him sitting there and he's 83 years old he's sitting sitting there working out his his actions and then he would do them exactly the same and i mentioned it to Bo at one point and he said more or less almost exactly what you just said vince he said well dad was in so many crappy b movies that he knew that if he didn't match exactly, they would just they wouldn't use his best performance. So he wanted to make huh. sure that he matched when he did his absolute best take. And so and, and so it is. Great it's, story. It's, it's great. It's great. It's great advice, and it's it's something I, I, I I'll always remember. Yeah. You are not if you're an actor and you match you and you consistently match. You are not being some hack. You are not being less of an artist for doing so. The artistry, it's up to you to, to put all that artistry in there, and you're figuring out all that. You're really figuring out most of that business, if not all of it, yourself in the first place. But if you don't stick with it, if instead you're like, oh, I just got to feel it every take, you're, you're boning yourself. Yeah, it's, no, you, yeah. it's super yeah. helpful. I mean, you know, it definitely is super helpful. Sometimes we don't have good matchers and we got to work with it, but it's not fun. It's not, it's, and you know, a lot, some of your best stuff is going to get not used because it just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, it's important to be mindful of those. I mean, not just matching, but as an actor, it's. I think it's important to be at least knowledgeable about the other things that go into it. Because like you said, part, yeah. yeah, you're enabling your best performance to come through right. when you do little things like that. Here's the hard part, though, like about that. it, you know, and it's, it's kind of a, it's a subject that we've talked about. I mean, you know, we as this group have talked about many times, but on every show you've talked about, I'm sure you guys as producers have talked about it on many shows, where it's kind of a, it's, you know, actors don't usually come in the cutting room, so they may not really understand why things work, why, you know, you need to match. And it's a sticky thing because they're, they're not going to really have the experience of understanding what that is. So it's, it's kind of difficult to explain to them why it's important. Yeah, that's true. It, it, yeah, it makes sense. It's hard it's to like explain. It's like finding your light. It's just one of those things yeah. that you kind of have to yeah, you learn. Gotta, uh -huh. You want to explain uh, what that means? A lot of people don't even know what that means. It I just, didn't for the longest time. <laughs> I mean, every shot is set up very, very specifically with different lighting because, you know, camera position and actor position and blocking, it changes how it's going to look on film or on video, mm -hmm. depending on the light. So every time you ch move the camera, you have to change the lighting so that it all matches. So that it all looks um, right. And so, and that's why you do things like you block a scene ahead of time and you have marks for actors to hit so they remember where they were standing. Because if they're like even like a fraction of an inch off, depending on the lighting, you can't see them properly. They create shadows, it creates other problems. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, actors are taught very early to know where their light is and yeah. make sure that they mm -hmm. are there so that we can see them yeah. and they look their best. And I'm sure for a lot of <laughs> actors, especially folks who come at it from the theater, it feels very bullshit, mechanical. Yeah. Kinda. And so be it. I'm not here to argue whether it's there's you know it's it, there's a mechanicalness to it and a stop and start uh, a uh, fracturedness to it that probably does make it very hard to 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 enjoy versus theater acting where you're really submerged in the moment. But that's the job. If you want that job, if you don't want that job, don't don't go looking for it. If you want that job, just like any other job in the universe, uh, do your damnedest to 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 do what you need to do to to be. The best at it, but so, John uh, can talk about it more because you don't you don't light it and then block it. You block it first. Well, you know, you bring <laughs> up one of my one of the most important things that they don't teach you in film school, which is blocking. Blocking is so important, and I've seen so many directors 
uh, and myself included, get in a situation in a scene where you realize you blocked it wrong, and now you're you're adding shot after shot after shot to try to work, tell yeah, the story. And, and sometimes those directors will go back and change after they've shot that master, and then we are really fucked as yeah. editors. We're yeah. like, you know, it's yeah. like, uh, you guys just decided to do something else. Well, can't you just fix it anyway? You get that a lot. <laughs> we get that a lot. And, anyway. and you know, it's, when you're when you're you know directing, especially and particularly in a uh, in a television show where you have seven eight days to to do it, you know that blocking affects the lives of everybody on set, right. and it, and it's really in a sort of an unsung uh, uh, skill that uh, that people should really study. If you want to be a director, if you want to do this, you should study that because yeah. everybody is waiting to see where they're standing, and then everything hinges on that: uh, the camera position, the lighting position, yeah. the the set, the the art department. Everything goes around how you block that, and and I and you know just. Uh, you know, I, I I learned from a lot of wonderful directors that we had, particularly on the X Files, yeah. and then and then on Breaking Bad, and DPs, as well. Um, and you know, so we'll spend more time in rehearsal worrying about that than about actually, do they have the scene? Do they have the moment? You know, where's the character turn here? It's like, no, where am I standing? And I'll often just go in and and I mean, I, I learned a long time ago, you know, not to shoot. Uh, uh, how do I put it? Um, you know, sh shoot the actors, don't shoot the set. So it's like, let the yeah. actors come in and let them try it a few times and see yeah, how it feels. And does this feel right? Do you feel right walking over here to, yeah. before you say that line? No, I don't. Okay, where do you want to go? And then we build everything around that yeah. rather than the other way around. This is where you have to stop. That's where so, rehearsal, yeah. rehearsal is, you know, very, very important. You know, in, in TV, we don't have that much time. You really, no, right. you, get luxury very little time. Yeah. Yeah. you get very little time, but it's time well spent. And it feels when you're when you're on the set and there's rehearsal going on, it feels like everyone's standing around doing nothing. And, it, and you know, when you're especially if you're directing, you feel this, you feel this, you feel all the eyes boring in the back of your head. Oh, yeah. and, and your assistant director kind of, so how long is how long is this rehearsal going to go on for? But boy, every 30 seconds that you spend in rehearsal, if it's done right, saves you an hour later on. Later yes. on, and I, and I yeah, remember, right. I, 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 boy, I'm just seconding what John said. And you know, it's, there's, it's valuable to have, because most, you know, most directors, uh, I, th I think all of us here, we, we directed, you know, a, a few dozen hours, a few, a, few, a few dozen days, but the DP, and the the uh, and the operators have worked hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of, days. Thousands of days, and that's yeah. when that's when sometimes you know you the the DP will whisper in your ear. I remember many a time Michael Slovis saying, you know, if you're over here, this is going to give you're going to have eight, you're going to have six more setups. And Arthur you, Albert was yes, wonderful Ar at that. And, and, yeah. and, and Marshall, Marshall and, now, and, yeah. and it's all they're, they're really that's that's where it really does it really does help an awful lot. And but it's 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 got to be everything uh, John said. I'm just seconding that. The one thing too that as from somebody who does not want to direct, but also someone who directing directors are incredibly important to me. You've got actors who have hopefully, you know, memorized their lines and really come up with their background and all the, the, uh, the, the work that they need to do before they show up at the set, but they don't know the blocking before they get there. So all of that work that they've done, they now have to reapply mm -hmm. to whatever, oh, so now I'm gonna go to the kitchen and say this line, and they didn't think that. So mm -hmm. everybody's gotta be on their game. I'm, I, I remember helping a friend of mine do uh, an independent film that he was doing, and I was gonna be a, a camera assistant. It was the only time I was a camera assistant, I was really happy to do it and glad that it was not the job that I picked originally to do. <laughs> but it was fun doing it for that you know, 15 days or whatever. Um, and what I realized, I think I might have told you this story, I, th I realized then that, you know, you really do take a chance as a director, as a producer to hire these actors because they got to come in and they got to be, they got to know their oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You are taking such a chance that if they can't deliver, your whole thing is just off the rails. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, so, yeah. and these are people who have scenes together who maybe have never met they may have, you know, some serious, you know, very, very important scene, and they gotta hit it, and they gotta hit it in three takes, yeah. you know, and they they gotta be on. And I was, it was the first time, after being in the editing room for years, it was my first time realizing, it really does all hinge on people coming to play, mm -hmm. and yeah. really, really knowing, and and taking a chance. Yeah. So that's true. That's a really interesting point uh, that you know, for so many actors, 
you know, they really are coming in to work a day or two on a show with people they have probably never met before, uh, but with a crew who all knows each other. Mm -hmm. um, and same with directors, because a lot of directors are coming into a set that they maybe have never worked on before, mm -hmm. and just being able to kind of know their, where they are <laughs> and be able to do their job, um, it is a real skill. Uh, and probably something that gets better as you as you you know move along in the world. But I mean, I think we're really lucky on this show with our actors and with our directors. But you know, I'm thinking of the scene with um, Chuck and ADA uh, Kira Hay and um, mm. Kimberly Gregory Kim who came yes. in for that. I mean, uh, she came in for that. She came in so for like good. two days, I think. Yes, and just and two. and she. You know, it was a it was a very quick to kind of turnaround for her, and you know, she had to come in and do the scene with Michael McKeon, who is, you know, a main character and has been working in the business forever, um, and she was great. She and was. you know, she's such and a she's, good actress. Yeah. And she's a lovely person, just very oh, very good. sweet nice. and and really ready to be there. Um, and you know, it was really interesting that thing of like that must be really disorienting as an actor. You Absolutely. Know? No, you're right. And she's a good example because she arrived on set and within an hour she was shooting a major scene yeah. 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 With, yeah. with a major actor. And it's like, that's terrifying. Pages of dialogue. Technical dialogue. Yeah. She is so good on Vice Principals. Mm -hmm. yeah. She is such a good actress. So that was good. Peter's that's, obsession. You, you yeah. brought her up, that's, and, and I thank you for it. Well, it was, it was, sort, of, it was sort of me, but it was actually I ran into uh, our, our, our Fantastic casting people, the Ali Thomas. I ran into them at a party, and we were just kicking. We were just talking about Vice Principals, and they brought her up. And I, said, oh my God, we've got to find a place. We've got to find her place for her on the show. So that was that was it was it was not it was really Sharon and Sherry uh, bringing bringing her up to me more than more than any any brilliant uh, lightning bolt in my on my part. But I have to say, she is she is wonderful. And you know, you talk about actors being prepared. Um, I'm trying to say this in a way that it won't, it's not going to be a spoiler for the future. But there was a point during this season where I, I was going to, to say, I, hap, I happened to find out the actors were in LA and they were, they were preparing. And we were act, I actually went to Bob's house and there, there was a big chunk of our cast and also some guest cast sitting around a table on their time off working on a scene that they knew was coming up in a week. Wow. And this this, this is this God is a, this is a this, fired them on the spot. This is <laughs> this is a you know that's I think that's I think that's there's such a work ethic and yeah I, yeah I was I'm I'm treasuring all these people uh, but the, the it's such there's these folks are really so focused on coming into uh, prepared and on respecting the story it's just it's it's a that really warmed warmed my heart tremendously and and uh, i'm so glad i still have not ever met kimberly in person but it's so many times in in, in uh, kelly's heard me say it in in, in what we while we've been cutting i just oh, this she's fantastic and one of the things she brings to her performance is so detailed every she's filled every little moment with thought and she's got so much confidence you know, in both uh, in this in the scene that you that you guys have, she is she's taking over. You know, she's mm -hmm. taking over. She is she is go she is matching up with Michael McKeon, and doing such a such a beautiful job. And of course, Michael, by the way, uh, it's what a wonderful scene. Uh, and he he added something that I don't know if I don't know Jenny if you were expecting, but when he's talking about his brother at the end of the scene, he's talking about how he loses his temper, and Michael's voice kind of breaks. I'm sitting there going, is he bullshitting or not? I can't <laughs> yeah. quite. Yeah. I, I, wrote, I wrote that quite, same thing in my notes. Yeah. I he actually can't quite, seems I can't quite him, tell. Is he? And boy, this is these two these two mm -hmm. uh, these yeah. two brothers really they're both consummate role players, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. I thought my, my vote was that he's he's uh, that wasn't genuine. That was that was his plan. Yeah. But that's yeah. just yeah. It's, it's wonderfully done. Yeah, it it gives wonderful. you a lot of food for thought. It is. Well, that scene, oh, sorry, I'm just one last thing uh, about, about Kimberly. If you haven't seen, uh, and I haven't seen all of the show, uh, I'd like to catch up on all of it. But uh, Vice Principals, uh, the scene when she gets drunk. Have you seen that? It's like bra bravi bravura uh, acting. Oh my God. It's this amazing sequence where she's getting having more and more vodkas in this bar. And it's just getting, it's heading really south. I'm going to put it on my list. <laughs> she is, it's yeah. an amazing scene. She's yeah. really, even though I theoretically she's supporting on that show, she's really the co-lead, uh, I think. And it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a, uh, 
I, I, I really enjoyed with, that uh, show. The dude from Eastbound and Down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Danny McBride and uh, Danny, Walton Goggins. Danny McBride, and Danny McBride Walton, Walton Goggins. Goggins. Yeah, yes. uh, excellent, uh, the, the wonderful actors on that but, show. But Kimberly Gregory is definitely, I, I th- to my mind anyway, the third lead on that show. Oh yeah, absolutely. Can we talk a little bit about how Kim and Jimmy's relationship has? You know, I mean. Basically, Jimmy goes to court and he basically rejects Kim, and she's like pissed at at that point. Can you guys talk about you know what what you guys wanted to start creating at that point? Yeah, I think, and it's sort of interesting because I think it it very much hurts him to reject her, and in a way, it's not a rejection so much as trying to kind of save her from the trouble. Oh yeah, um, you know because he doesn't he doesn't call her when he gets arrested even though he probably should because you know his idea is I'm going to I'm going to get out I'm going to take care of this and then I can go home I can take a shower I can come see her and I can explain what happened and then I have full control of the situation you know the last thing he wants is for Kim to see him in this orange jumpsuit and the, the last last thing he wants is for overworked uh, overtired Kim to have to do anything to like help save him at the same time you know they 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 do love each other, and 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 they are important in each other's lives. So for her, of course, she's going to help. Like that's mm-hmm. just automatic. That's what you do. And so I think it's a really hard moment for her, because I don't think she necessarily understands why he's doing that. And so when he comes to her at the office and and does his whole, you got to let me do this for myself, because he's expecting her to fight that. <laughs> he really is. And, uh, you know, he's been rehearsing the speech and he's all ramped up and then he does it and she says, okay. I think that's an interesting moment for both of them because he really was expecting to have to fight her. But she also understands that this is, okay, if this is what he has to do, this is what he has to do. I think in the back of her mind, she realizes eventually he is going to need her help. But she's not going to force that on him and sort of like when he comes around or, or later. And that's what plays out in that final scene of, okay, I've let you handle it, tell me what's going on, and then when he presents this new problem of the uh, the bar hearing, that's when she's basically like, look, come on, let's just drop this. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. this is what we do, we help each other. Yeah. I, I think, too, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think there's some interesting parallels be- between the two of them, because in season two, when, when she says, you don't save me, I save me. And then he says the same thing, but he can't. He's not, I mean, she really did bootstrap herself. And then weirdly, I think he tried to save her by his, you know, actions with Chuck and, you know, getting yeah. her in the Mesa Verde thing. Yeah. But but their methods are so, so completely opposite. That's and so, point. and Jimmy just, again, can't help himself. And I think that he's just so his methods can be so unhinged that you know it gets him and everybody else in trouble. And yeah. I feel like yeah. I feel like he wants to save her from that. Do you think but he he's still the one feels... who got her in trouble? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. All, think, always. He got yeah, himself always. in oh, trouble yeah. here. He got oh, yeah. her in trouble. Oh, yeah. before. Do, you, do you think he still feels a little guilty because of you know the Chuck? He, he basically pulled her into the Chuck thing. I know she made a choice. But from still. my from from my perspective, I think there is a level of guilt. I think that. I think it's a decision that he thinks was the right thing to do, but I do think, you know, all the fallout, you know, those consequences, I think it's it's got to be bothering him on a certain level. I and think he should feel guilty. He's, he does. He's maybe really screwed should. up a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, and, but he also did it for, you know, good reasons. Um, so I think it's a really complex question. I don't think it's just, oh, I screwed up, I shouldn't have done that, or no, I absolutely was doing the right thing because I was doing it for her. I think like all things that you do in relationships, there's so many different factors yeah. going into it. And we you know we talk about this a lot. Like it's very, one of the big things in the human condition is sort of feeling two completely opposite things at the same time yeah. or wanting two completely opposite things yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And I think Jimmy is a big, that's a big part of, of Jimmy's life. That's a good point. You know? I, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that scene, that first scene you were talking about a minute ago, uh, Jenny. I love that scene when he first comes into her office. There's a, such an interesting dichotomy there, or I don't even know if that's the right word, but it's two wonderful actors, uh, Bob and Ray, getting across their emotions in two very different ways. He comes into her office, she's sitting at her computer, and he, in a thousand words that just flow out <laughs> pell mell, and he does this bravura job of saying all these wonderful words, and he's—I don't know—it's a long monologue, mm-hmm. and he nail—and I think you—you you guys hold on it as a yeah. wonder, yeah. Yeah. and it's yeah. wonderful. 
I yeah. talked to him before we shot. I said, I'm not going to cut. You just have to do it. He's and like, and, and it was it. great. He's like, and, I want to do it. And it's like, this oh. wonderful bravura theatrical, uh, theater-like uh, experience where you're watching this amazing stream of consciousness monologue. And then she has one line, except that her, I think of that one line, the way she delivers it like a bullion cube. <laughs> I mean, it's this tiny little shit. She basically <laughs> just says, okay, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's so thick with meaning and emotion, just that one that she just jam packs into that one word. It's like this bullion cube that you turn into a giant bowl of soup. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's just uh, when you unpack it, really wonderful. Uh, right in just in that one scene, you see two wonderful styles uh, of acting. Uh, all yeah, I was just really mention, great. I was going to mention that a little bit earlier, too, was that John shot, he shot her side of it, but when I got it, I'm like, I'm watching the deals, and I'm like, I don't need to go away from him. I don't want to go away from him. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that um, I got some notes at one point. I'm not sure whose notes they were, but they, you know, they were like, is there any other coverage? And I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to go. I don't want to I don't wanna turn away from him. Um, and I think we end up using I think we turned around at one point, well, one time. For her, for her line, her and, yeah. Just and at then, the end, I think. Yeah, just for her line. but it was, like, funny because um, I think when I cut it and then you came in, you're like, yeah, there's no no problem. We don't need to go away. And the one thing that I do like as an editor, especially you know nowadays, because I I just love shots that have a foreground. And when you can show two actors in your shot, mm -hmm. you know I'm always like, look, they, they give each other energy, yeah. even if the one of them doesn't say anything. Yeah. They give even if you don't see the other one's face, you know, even the back of their they give each other energy. So it's so much better to have them together. And when when directors shoot. You know that way where you get to see you know part of it and you because you see part of her face it's sideways you know you get to see what she's you thinking see, you see all you need but to you see you don't want yeah. to go away from him at all yeah. you know he's you know i was going to also bring up that really i loved the part in the courtroom when he starts to explain himself and i know you laughed like yesterday oh when i you laughed saw out it, loud yeah. but when he starts to explain himself and the court reporter is trying to get the information you know? Yes, yes, that was my, that was one of my favorite moments of that That's day. That's a great moment. That was a real court reporter. She was she actually uh, works as an extra, and I think she's done the show before. I think, uh, or at least she came in for it. Okay, she might have come in for um, it. Yeah. But uh, no, it was a it was a genuine instinct on her part, in, even in in an early take to do that because she has to hear everything that's mm -hmm. said in the courtroom mm -hmm. and when I saw that it was like oh my god that's hilarious so I said, let's set up a shot just for her <laughs> so we can see her because <laughs> it's like he's saying this real personal embarrassing right. stuff and it's like mm -hmm. but you know what the other thing that I love about it not just that there's a moment where Kim is here and she's like trying to say to him stop talking yeah, 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 I don't yeah. care what your reason is right now yeah. do not say this oh, yeah, and, yeah. you know and it was like Such to me it was scene. just like a really wonderful moment between the two of them but then and then also in that scene that the, the uh, uh judge oh how good is she yes she's, she's really good she's very uh, believable molly hagan who's yeah. what uh, and you told me what she had been in previous? well uh yeah kelly and i have seen her in a couple different things because kelly remembered her from some, some kind, kind of wonderful some kind of wonderful oh. and i remembered her from election she oh, plays matthew broderick's yeah, wife yeah. She yeah. Election. yes um, she's great. Yeah, she's been, and she's also uh, on the show I Zombie as oh, Liv's mom. I heard that's um, really good. Yeah, 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 it is, it is. Uh, so she's, you know, she's been a working actress for for quite a while, oh, and, nice. and I don't know, she was she was an early favorite. I feel like when we were casting, from you know? very early on. Yeah, she just she feels real. She feels, she feels absolutely, absolutely real. She was wonderful. So we covered the shoes on the wire, and we covered the whole uh, shooting of the shoes on the wire. <laughs> um, but what about the sort of plot that you guys came up with to do that? The sort of the redirect. I mean, I, I know when, when you and I were in the room, John, we were talking about it. I was saying, you know, we're dealing with a misdirect here for our audience for a moment. Like, we don't know. We at first think that Mike is going to shoot them, right? And then, you know... And he uh, could. He could, but Many that's times. not... But that's the whole point. And, right. And, then, and so I, I, I don't want to talk about it because you guys were in the room. Well, how did you guys try... You know, how did you guys come up with this way to kind of misdirect us? Or did you mean to misdirect us? Well, yeah, and I want to hear about 
what John has to say because you know when we wrote that the idea the reason we did that the him firing the gun and in, in uh, not at them was because there was concern that as they're driving away he fires the gun and shoots the shoe that they would hear the gunshot because it's very loud it's going to echo and they would stop it would raise an alarm of some kind um, and then they'd notice the dope coming out of the shoe overhead. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we were like, what can we do so they don't... There's no way to hide the sound of the gun. Uh, so the idea was brought up, well, maybe it's there's a lot of gunshots, so they just write it off as hunters. And so that's what we wrote. But, of course, communicating that visually is kind of a challenge. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Well, you know, it brings up something that I actually Chris Carter said to me a million years ago when we were on that show that the art of dramatic writing is, is, is creating in the audience the need to watch. Hmm. And it applies to, and, and this was, this, the whole script was terrific, but, but in all the scripts that come out of this writer's room are, are, are terrific and in their storytelling in that, and, 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 and that's something that you have to modulate and you modulate in the script, you modulate it on the set and you modulate it in the editing room, but this idea of how much the audience knows, how much mystery, they want a mystery. Yeah. If you give him the answer, like I, we were talking about earlier, yeah. you could you could say, "Oh, I'm going to put some meth in this shoe and 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 implicate these guys." You could do the whole scene in one, yeah, in in one scene, and then just see the outcome. Yeah. But no, what makes it good storytelling is that you're you're it's a series of misdirects, or if not misdirects, so much as mysteries. So it's like you know, yeah. it even starts before that. It's like well, you plant the seed. Jenny plants the seed in the very first scene of Act One that he's going to do something. Yeah. You know, Mike's going to do something about these guys. Yeah. About, uh, uh, what's his name? Hector. Hector, thank you. He's going to do something. So the audience already is wondering, what's he going to do? Yeah. And that's what hangs over the rest of the episode. Yeah. And so you give them clues, and, you, and, and it grows in its mystery at the same time you answer things. So he goes to the clinica, and, uh, and even that scene, the way it's written, is, is so lovely uh, and, uh, because it implies, it tells me how I'm going to shoot it, to be honest. And it builds mystery. It's like first you see this doctor, and, and some we get people, the Mexican doctor. We get the Mexican Yay! doctor, JB Block. Well, it's so good seeing him again. He's so good. He, oh, yeah, he, he really is. And yeah. I think, but what's what, what I loved about it was the scene works even if you don't remember who that was. Yeah, so that's it's not true. Just that's a, true. Absolutely. Uh, here's someone from the past. Absolutely. But it's why are we here? Why are we at this clinic? And then he's talking about a gringo with the, the, the Montezuma's Revenge. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, reveal Mike. Well, then what's he do? So you're giving these little answering questions, asking a new question. Yeah. You know, so why are we yeah. here? Well, why is Mike here? And then he doesn't say what a lesser show would say, which is, I've come here to buy some meth. Right. No. He says, you talk to, you know, we, we talk about Gus, and but uh, obliquely. Yeah. And, they, and he tells him what he wants, but just by shape. Yeah, I want yeah, this yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's all answering and then asking. Yeah. And, and it, that plays all the way through. And that's why it's such a, a compelling scene visually because, and it, it's tricky, and this is always tricky, because you can confuse an audience sure. and you can't go too far. And then all of a sudden there's too much mystery and they're going, wait, I'm totally confused. Yeah. So it's that, that's where the, you know, the, sort of the artistry for all the departments and everybody comes together in this kind of, you know, creating this need to watch. It's like, I, I, I need to know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And then I, I, yeah. I love the way you directed the scene. I love the way you wrote it. I love that scene. I love, among other things, I love saying JB again, but like you said, very excellent point. You don't need to know, you don't ever need to have seen Breaking Bad to find that scene very riveting, very interesting. I don't know if riveting is the right word, but just just very interesting. It, 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 it's the essence of what Chris Carter told you. It keeps you watching. And what I love, one of the things I love about it is you take your time with it. The way you wrote it and the way you directed it, there's this, it's not long, it's perfect, but it's there's this somewhat leisurely moment of him and you like him. He's a good doctor. Yeah. And he's looking out for this little kid. And like, where in the world is this going? going yes. And then you realize uh, Mike is a, a lollipop. Yeah, I love the way he plays it. He reminds me, I was saying to you yesterday, he reminds me so much of, uh, of I can't ever think of the actor's name, from Raiders of the Lost John Rhys Davies. John yes. Rhys Davies, who plays... Uh, <laughs> Who does he play in? Uh, Sulla. Sulla, Sulla, and in, uh, in, uh, in Raiders of the Lost Ark. He reminds me so much of him. And, and a little he, bit of Brian did, Blessed, They're too. both from the UK, so. Oh, yeah, Our yeah. Mexican doctor is yeah. uh, Oh, English. Brit. Yeah. He's a Brit. Is he a Brit? He yeah. is, indeed. Does he speak with a British accent? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. I think <laughs> I never met him. Yes. But he's a Spanish speaker as well. 
or, or uh, is not he? really. He, he <laughs> really? had a lot of trouble with it. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. Oh, oh, I didn't know see, that. See, this is yeah. this is where no. the good acting comes. <laughs> this is what happens. Yeah. yeah. I just so thought he was a natural speaker. Yeah, he had to learn it. He he learned it very carefully. Yeah, we have a consultant wow. translator who translates everything, records everything for wow. the actors as well, and then we had a long conversation about what exactly, how exactly they would refer to. You know, Montezuma's Revenge? Yes. Because yeah. <laughs> there's different colloquialisms. And yeah, I guess that's an American so, colloquialism. Yeah, yeah, so we came up, well, with La Vanganza, which is the revenge, which would be. The revenge. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, so um, it's like a whole team effort. And then, you know, making sure that everybody knows how to pronounce everything. Nice. And, so when you guys hired him for Breaking Bad, you didn't realize that he sp- didn't speak Spanish? I think his scene was in English. Just yeah. in my little uh, 2001 was, baby space baby bubble, <laughs> most of the time. I, I believe. <laughs> I think. I think. Wasn't it? Isn't he was it mostly talking to Mike. I, he was mostly talking oh, to Mike and Je- right. Mike and Jesse. Yeah. Right? He, had, he yeah. only said a word or two in Spanish. Yeah. Mm. I also really like that in this universe, the like the medical practitioners are the gateway to the underworld. Doctor, you're the veterinarian. But they're very good at what they do. They're yes. not like yeah. crappy doctors. No. They're good doctors. They care. That vet cares, yeah, he cares about his like, animals. Oh, yes, he does. I love, I love so. that. And this yeah. guy's good with little kids. Yeah, little kids. Yeah. He's you got know, a good bedside manner. You, you could imagine that maybe he just works with Gus in order to fund these cl- fund, fund the clinic. clinic. You know, yeah. so maybe. who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah. actually, I, you I could imagine that. that actually, yeah. <laughs> the, the fun behind the scenes thing that uh, was sort of fun for me was. It's a it's a half a block. The Clinica set is yeah. actually a veterinarian office. <laughs> really, and it's a yeah. half a block from That's Los Pollos Hermanos. No. Uh, what the restaurant is that? Is uh, it really? Yeah, it's right there. Wow. I was like, oh, yeah. I know this area. Yeah. Well, that's cool. <laughs> is there, do you want to just uh, mention or talk just very briefly about this document that Jimmy has to do because this is what Chuck is determining that he has to do to solve this problem? The PPD? The, yeah. What a PPD is? Well, I just, you know, it's the last scene of the show, so I figured if, you know, you guys want to talk about that. And just I think you guys explain it nicely. It might bear a little more explanation, but you guys explain it nicely. That's a, always a tough thing, by the way, yeah. to explain. You've got two lawyers in a scene. They both intimately know what a PPD is, but 99% of the audience not only doesn't know what it is, maybe has never even heard the, the, uh, the, the phrase before. So you got to get them to explain to one another what it is, and you have to do it artfully enough so it doesn't feel like the thing we always say in the writers' room. Bob, how long have we been brothers? Yeah. You know, that's what we yeah. always say. Yeah. So you did it very artfully. But yeah. not only that, it's what what you guys are doing as well is you're you're explaining to us what Chuck's motivation is behind this. Yeah, did yeah. You? This is a question I get because I on Twitter I'll sometimes do like Q and A's on writing. And this is a question I get a lot is like, how do you do those exposition scenes? And I mean, that's something that every writer struggles with no matter how long they've been working. Um, and the, the hardest, the hardest times is when you have two characters who already know all the information. And so kind of one of the ways you can do it is sort of turn it into a, like an argument or a debate of like, well, what do we do? And then there are ways to sort of, you know, sort of trickle that information in and it's less about this is what a PPD is and more about well these are the consequences how do we deal with those consequences because that's that's the thing that they would be able to talk right. about and as far as sort of expressing what Chuck's motivation is one of the moments I, I liked uh, in that scene was when you know Kim's like this PPD is great like this is this is great it's it's you know get out of jail free card and then Jimmy said and she says oh Chuck must have been pissed and she's taking pleasure in that it's not a it's not an exposition line it's a character emotion line yeah. of like yeah stick yeah. it to Chuck and then when Jimmy says well it was Chuck's idea she immediately knows what that means she immediately knows that that's a bad thing and that Chuck has some sort of plan because Chuck wouldn't just sort of mm-hmm. give up that kind of power and so I really like that moment where she just says shit, and we get what that means. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, okay, well, what specifically is he trying to do? Right. Mm-hmm. She just knows he's trying to do something. Right. And so that's when Jimmy's able to give the information about, I have yeah. to give the felony confession to the Bar Association, and then you're able to go from there. So it is a really, it's really tricky to do that stuff, and you don't always 100% nail it, but the key is to just try to, you know, just make it as organic as possible and find ways in that communicate information without just saying what it is and also what's the smallest amount of information you you can give and make it clear and that's kind of what you're aiming for well and that specific line too about it being chuck's idea and that's that's where it 
for again having not read the script or anything it just it recolors that scene with chuck where we yeah. wonder god is he really uh, no this is all part of he it he has a yeah. plan yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's and you spell it out beautifully. You you explain it beautifully. Say it's not about Jimmy going to jail. It's about Jimmy never being a lawyer ever ever again. What does PPD stand for again? Uh, obviously, uh, it's, it's explained. It's the, pre-prosecution diversion. Pre-prosecution. So basically, it's yeah. something you do before you even get into sort of the prosecution of a case. So right. it's a way to. It's like uh, you're just sort of essentially saying, okay, I did this, and it's really only for low risk things, yeah. um, and it gets kind of put away. But the idea is. If you end up reoffending within yeah. that period of time, you do not go to trial. You do not get to do anything. You just maximum penalty for right. what you confess to. So it's a thing, and it's not offered everywhere. It's a thing that uh, a lot of people end up doing, and for some people, it's good. But it's also really great for lawyers because <laughs> so many people, you know, find some, you know, end up reoffending even inadvertently, and then they they don't have to. Go through the time or the expense of going through a whole prosecution. They Prosec- can just immediately. Prosecutors love it. Senate prosecutors, prosecutors love it. And hey, defense hey, attorneys and love uh, it. Both, yeah. brother, yeah. Before we before we go past it though, but Jenny, what is your Twitter handle so people can follow your? Because you you, oh. you say you give a lot of great writers advice on, uh, on Twitter. It's uh, Jen Hutchison, and that's G E N N H U T C H I S O N. Yeah, that's a good one to follow if you're interested yeah, in writing. Absolutely. Jenny, do you remember how we came across? Because none of us, oh, by the yeah. way, I has has. Has hastened to add that none of us are lawyers. In the, uh, the Gordon's probably the closest thing to a lawyer because he's related to so many of them. But none of us yeah. are lawyers. None of the closest thing to a nuclear physicist. We, That's um, right. <laughs> we spoke to a DA from who works in Berlin, actually, uh, and whose name is escaping me right now. Um, she's a friend of she's Melissa's. She's a friend of Melissa Bernstein's, yes. and she very kindly got on the phone with us, and we said, "Here's the situation. Here's what this person has done." Can you just walk us through what would the prosecutor charge them with? What would the defense argue um, to get out of it? What's the worst thing that could happen? What's the best thing that could happen? And she she was like, oh, well, or you could just do a PPD. And we're like, oh, well, what's a PPD? And she mentioned it. We're like, that's kind of perfect because it means he has to totally admit wrongdoing. Yeah. But it also would be very appealing to him at the same time. So it ended up kind of being exactly the thing that we wanted. And because this is where she works, you know, she works in New Mexico. Um, though, because laws vary by state, it was something that we were like, okay, great, because that's something that is applicable yeah. to where she is. And then we did some further research and got got more details. That young lady was a huge help. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, that's all. She's off great. To her. Can yeah. I mention one thing right quick as well? Um, that scene, I think, was the first time that we're in that back space, right? Yes. Yeah. In, in that back space with the with bats back, I mean, that's backlit. And what was it like to shoot back there? Was it it's prohibitive? It's funny because, is you it? know, you read a script and you go, wow, there's this giant action scene with car crashes and burning things. And then you have two people talking. And that's actually more difficult. Two people who are not moving, talking for six pages. And who are dark. <laughs> and in much. the dark. It's almost like they're silhouetted. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, God bless Marshall and 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 Steve Latecki and the lighting and whatnot, um, because the first thing we, we we had a very long meeting about it. How can we, you know, how are we going to light this and how can we light it naturally without it looking the fake moonlight thing that everybody does just to fill, so you can see the actors' faces. And we were just standing there in front of the glass bricks. It was like, can we light through those? Yeah, that's it. And that that I think made the scene magical, uh, and helped. And also it helps having great actors who can do that much dialogue and keep it interesting without having to use the crutch of moving or cutting, you know, I mean, or do half the scene in one room and half the scene in the next room, you know, all that stuff that you, the tricks you do. It was interesting too, beautiful cutting lighting. that scene. Go ahead, sorry. No, no I'm sorry, just beautiful lighting. It's, I was it's just one say, thing to mention, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, no, we're all no, interrupting no, each other because we're so excited. <laughs> uh, one thing I don't think we mentioned uh, in any of the other podcasts is that this office is now a set. Mm-hmm. The uh, Wexler okay. McGill, yes. which was in fact a location. Well, the front in, in, of it is, but the season. inside. Well, the exterior of the front is is exterior of the front is a location. Yeah. But there is now uh, a company has moved into our empty Wexler McGill office. There's a, there's a very successful real estate company in there, so we were obligated. And Michael Novotny, our production designer, an amazing our amazing uh, art department. Uh, built the interior and part of the exterior 
Uh, and it is uh, one of the things I think they did that was kind of amazing is that the, one of the, the most interesting parts of that set, there's the glass brick, of course, at the location. This is probably why we picked it way back when, was the glass brick. And also the ceiling has these strips of metal that are reflective. And they had to, the art department had to, I remember watching them uh, have to, they had, fabricating those strips of metal and they put it all together. And I have to say, it's, it's, a, it's a nice set to shoot in. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very easy set to shoot in. And, so and much nicer shooting job. on the set than it was shooting in the real it place. It really, really is. And that ceiling, you think, well, just go out and buy a ceiling from the company that made the one in the, no way. That doesn't exist anymore. Could not find it. That, so they, you're talking about the mirror ceiling. The, the copper, the yeah. copper, yeah. the That's copper right. ceiling, uh, and <laughs> they they did that by hand with different applications of uh, of mylar, of copper colored mylar, and it was a deal and a half. And they they kicked ass. It's an amazing, amazing. Chris like and I are saying amazing set. Chris and I are looking at each other. I think I know what he's going to say about that ceiling. It presents a lot of problems to us. Oh yeah. You know, many times yeah. when. It, we're lucky when you guys do some lockdown shots on it, but when we need to make things happen quickly, oh, yeah, yeah. we actually have to cover reflections in that ceiling mm -hmm. as well uh, when we're doing any kind of visual effects in there. Yeah. Was that what you were going to mention? I was thinking that. I was also just thinking about the insanity of, of uh, film and television production, of how many things, how many artists... We have to painstakingly recreate a thing that we just take for granted in yeah. the real world. Oh, it's yeah. So true. <clears throat> true. But, yeah, reflections are, are, are – like you don't even think about it just in glasses or sunglasses. Oh, yeah. You don't think about it in life, and you don't really see it necessarily on a low monitor. But in 4K on a big screen, yeah. Oh, yeah. reflections are a, a, a real deal. I was just going to mention that, that back patio, though, because – when we were working on, when John and I were working on that scene, which is just pretty much um, sort of raking shots and sort of 45s on each axis for those two actors, and you would think just on a regular on a regular set, regular lighting, they cut together quite easily. But I found that with that one, it didn't cut together that easily, and a lot of it was because of you know, on a raking shot, who was in focus, where that focus actually lay within the shot, and also because of the contrast that was coming from yes. those dark actors to that, and what added to it was the f the ripple of the glass brick. It was well, just eye. No, and it's interesting because the, the <laughs> eye naturally goes left to right uh, and, and toward the brightest thing, and it's not necessarily the actor's face, and so it, yeah. it, it, it's really a, a complicated. It was action. very yeah. puzzling because every time I was like, okay, this is gonna be no problem, and then when I would try and cut together you know, from, you know, Jimmy to Kim and just, you know, it wouldn't. Sometimes what what ended up happening a lot of times was I would just change sizes. Huh. So I wouldn't go from same size to same size. Wow. I would go from, you mm. know, wider to close or wider mm. and stuff like that. It, it was cuts just great. odd. And the way you guys did it, it, it looks great. It's, it's a, and I, I tell you, at the end when they hold hands and they're in silhouette and that full shot, the full mm -hmm. two shot, it made me think, oddly enough, I hadn't thought of in a while, I thought of Mulder and Scully. Mm. You know, so yeah. speak, we got we got three yeah, people totally. on this and worked on the X. I I thought if Mulder and Skelly had held hands like this, like around season, like any season, <laughs> people, people would have just shit them. Did they ever hold hands? It was such a night. They did, they and did. They, they, they there was they wonderful did. sparks between them, and there's. It made me think of the chemistry between those two, and it, it was wonderful chemistry then, and these guys have it too, I think. I mean, Should we bring up the, the the elephant in the room? I know, and not really an elephant, <laughs> but we have here John Chibin whose son, Jerry, was Mulder and Scully's first baby. That's right. right? That's right. So that's why I thought about when I said, did they ever hold hands? But no, they definitely hold, they held did. John's they held baby. <laughs> he's 16 years old now. He's 16 he's now, he's yeah. He's a good-looking, good-looking, strapping young he's a guy. Handsome man. Yeah. You want to talk about, uh, before we wrap up, what, we're, uh, what, you're, uh, what you're doing now? Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I've, just, I've signed on to become the showrunner of a Hulu show called Shut Eye, executive produced by our, our, the lovely Melissa Bernstein. Hey, excellent and, show. And uh, 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 starring Jeffrey Donovan and Katie Strickland and, uh, and Isabella Rossellini. And wow. uh, uh, so I'm coming on to, to run that show, and uh, we're just gearing up now, but uh, it's very exciting. Yay. Excellent they're show. Luck, they're awesome. lucky to have Thank you, John. You. I know I shouldn't. Yes, I don't need to mention this, but John was directing for us. But John is a writer. John has been oh, a writer for writer producer years director. and years and years yeah. and years. A and years. writer on Breaking Bad. He's got a just a ridiculously scary long resume. That's right. So. <laughs>
It's it's you know what is what's the thing from Chinatown old uh, politician build old buildings politicians and horse yeah always get respectful, get respectful. <laughs> I'll, I'll, age, right? I'll always be grateful to John because he's the one who uh, I in my mind anyway broke the uh, the, the 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 barrier between the the writers room and the director's chair on mm. Breaking Bad that's right uh, and I saw I saw John I saw John leave leave the writers room and get to direct his episode so that was when. Uh, that was one I begged. That was my be- first one. Too. That was, that one was I our first one together. That was ours, yeah. I love that episode. That's so a great episode. The, the that was the one destroyed. the RV got, yeah. got crushed. Great episode. And, <laughs> and well, one where we met Gail. Yes, yes we did. Yes. The yes. Yes. Never right. forget right. Gail Bedecker. With that great Vince Guaraldi uh, right. song that yeah. you put yeah. in there. Yeah. 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 And you, you named him after one of your favorite directors, right, Bud Bedecker? Is that right? I think that was Vince. That was your idea, wasn't it? I don't remember, but yeah, I, I don't I remember who Bud came Bedeker. up with I know you were talking about Bud Bedecker. I think we all love Bud Bedecker. Wonderful. He was, in real life, not just a great director of westerns and and. and and wonderful movies. He was also, in real life, an honest-to-God bullfighter. Oh. He even made a movie about Bullfighter. Yes, he did. Yeah. I was yeah. the one that had guy. the flies all over Mrs. Picatiwa. Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Good old Mrs. Picatiwa, you remember. The, yes. Yeah, where the cousins uh, come and, and kill Mrs. Picatiwa. Oh, yeah. man. I seem to remember your original pitch shoe was Mrs. Ironclaw. So I, that's, 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 <laughs> yeah. so I remember that. Very wow, well. yeah. There you go. Oh anyway, that's a trip down memory lane. Yes. <laughs> that nobody wants to hear. <laughs> I, I liked it. Anyway. Should we wrap this one? Yeah, wrap we're it wrapping up? it up. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for coming out. John, Jenny. Yeah, thank you. Peter, yeah, Vince. Thank you guys. Oh, yeah. Kelly. Thank you. It's fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks for fun thanks seeing for you guys. Thanks for you coming back. So we're so good you. to see you, I love you, being Chris. here. We love having you, man. <laughs> yeah, we do. I'm lucky to have you. I'm, well, I'm moving in. This All is right. great. Good. I have right. lost my lease. And this is a real godsend for me. We don't have a toilet, but we have a kitchen sink with a garbage disposal. So it'll work out. Uh, that's all I, I'll make do. That's all I need. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome, listeners. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Kelly, what do you? Who do you think? John. John. All right, John. Will you will you take us out? The way we sign off on the show is we have somebody do their best kind of Bob Odenkirk esque better call. You know, the well, I don't want to. I don't want to tell Bell you how to do it. Don't but give yeah. him a line reading. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. I stopped short. Oh, wow. Sell Thank it. You. Really sell it. Really sell it. Uh, uh, Pentecostal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>